I would actually uh, uh, disagree uh, because the, the point is really not that whether you feel is like a superhero. You're actually not. You're just sitting at a computer and you're, you're not a superhero. In your mm. real world, you're not. The point is happiness as a pursuit in the American Declaration of Independence and in other, when we talk, typically think about it, is that the main goal is to have a good life. Uh, and that means a real life, not a fake life in some virtual reality, but a real good relationship pursuing a real life so that when you really die, you, you can say kind of, this was a good life. But I, think, I don't have any regrets about it. I think what she's saying it. is that by having that, it is making their real life better. Well, but the day Yeah, and also, I mean, but the kind of games that I design, they take you out to the real world. So the game that we're running now, The Lost Ring, we're teaching people a real sport that you go out to real parks in real sports fields and, and you play it, but it's incredibly difficult to master it. So people are teaching, they're, teach, they're translating the rules into 20 different languages. They're teaching other real people how to play it. They're making art, they're making posters to, to help show how to play it. Uh, you're totally doing something for real. There's nothing, n there's nothing out of a reality okay. about it. And so that genre of gaming is trying to create that bridge between some games which are completely virtual and real life which is not a game. There are games that are bridging that. That's, that's what we're trying to do as alternate reality game designers. So I, I kind of agree with you, but I think you're missing out on this whole new genre of gaming that okay, let me is try finally this then, giving Jane. people a chance. Let yeah. me try this. If, if, if happiness is a real thing, and of course it is, then you can study it. And if you can study it, presumably, Uli, you can measure it. Yes. How do you measure happiness? Well, there's basically a uh, two approaches. One does work through the emotions, and we assume that when you have a good life, it will make you feel good. Uh, during good moments, you feel good. When something bad happens, you lose a loved one, you, you feel sad. And that's uh, important that you have that capacity. We don't want people who can't feel sad. We want people, though, not to lose loved ones unnecessarily. A person who has five children, we hope that they don't lose their children. So we want to minimize sadness because Things that make people sad are not happening. Okay, but Prevent how do you that, those events as how, much as how possible? How do you measure the happiness I will feel when the Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup? Please God, sometime in my lifetime. You don't have to uh, worry about measuring that. Why? Because it's never going to happen. <laughs> you know, you're never coming well, back on the show. How do we Shame measure on you. it. We measure it by asking <laughs> people because people have experiences that can tell us whether they're feeling happy or sad, uh, and we're also asking people about their life satisfaction. And I think that's very important because. Life is not just about maximizing pleasure at any moment. And then we get into this red rise, and at any moment we're like, will this really make me feel good now? Mm -hmm. And to take a, a step back and say, well, maybe this will actually create some melancholy. And I, uh, I watch a sad movie for a reason, because it will enrich me in other ways. And I can later still say, this was a good day, because I had a rich experience. Mm -hmm. So we I, ask people. I really don't think that you can measure it, you know, because it's so subjective. And so well, you can show two different colors of blue to someone and say, which, which is the bluest to two different people? Well, and they're going to have different ideas. Like, mm -hmm. happiness to me is like so blue. The, it's, there's it's no objective measurable. standard. There's 40 years of research that shows that these measures work. They're not perfect. Mm -hmm. They have their problems, difficulties, yeah. biases. Let me get Eric on work. this if I can. Eric, you want to come in on this? I, I do. Um, I think I agree with Uli to a certain extent here. Um, my book is really um, against happiness and for joy. And, and what I define as joy is not so much a desire for contentment or tranquility. It's a sort of exuberance that we get when we ha are having a fully lived life. But in my mind, this grows out often of a feeling of sorrow. And I can think of a great example from the literary canon. We think of John Keats, uh, early 19th century British poet, who said that we can only experience the world's beauty when we know the world is dying. Um, a real rose is fragile, it's tender, it's decaying. And when we experience that, we also experience the rose's beauty and we feel a kind of exuberance over that. So it's this really interesting connection between sorrow, death, and exuberance in Keats. And that shows up over and over again throughout the, the literary canon of the West. And my feeling is that joy and sorrow kind of go together. You, you can't have one without the other. Think of the great moments in life when you feel so happy you could cry or you're so sad you want to laugh. Um, so so I, I, if Uli's talking about authentic happiness as a kind of um, vital mix of, of rich experiences, joy, sorrow, and others, then, then I think we overlap a good bit. I, I think that's a really interesting point. I interviewed um, a man named Stephen Post, who's the head of an, the Institute for Unlimited Love in the States. And, and we talked about that idea that positive psychology has really sort of caught on sort of post 9-11. And I think that you're exactly right, is that when the, things are going badly, people want to find the positive and they mm -hmm. want to hear the, the good stories. And I think we've seen that over the last you know, seven years. I think people are really looking for, 
for happiness because the world is, you know, it's a hard place to be happy sometimes. But, but there is a fine line series, they're not between what you have just described and going to that self-help part of the bookstore where all of those, you know, some not very constructive and not very helpful books tell you how to be happy and, and mm -hmm. for much of that that's a crock. Right? Oh, it's absolutely a crock, but I think that the desire to find those answers is, is completely authentic. You know, I, I don't think a lot of the books themselves are filled with, with rubbish, but I think the fact that people are looking for those books is, is really an, an authentic desire for, for happiness. Jane, you design games, presumably in part because you want people to be happy. Do you find that is the prime emotion driving them to your games? Oh, well, you know, I think curiosity is probably what drives people to play games. They, they want to explore a new world. They want to learn a new story. They want to meet new people. Um, but I think what keeps people engaged in a particular game community is definitely that sense of being engaged on all of those different levels of mental engagement and social engagement. And, and they buy into the mythology, the story. It feels like, it feels like a, a, a real connection that they're making with, with the game world. Hmm. And Uli, let me ask you this. Where, where are you from originally? Uh, Germany. Germany. Okay, so you'd be an ideal person to ask this to. Because <laughs> there, there the Germans to... know happiness. No, no. <laughs> I meant more in a European sense here, which is uh, there seems to be something particularly North American about this pursuit of happiness, or maybe I'm wrong, but it feels that way from here. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes and no. I think there, in America there's a bit more this emphasis on the the smiley happiness and the extroverted happiness and jokes and good, just laugh it off and kind of, but uh, in the more deeper sense of the pursuit of happiness as having a good life, it's universal. I think it's, it's everywhere and that's what drives some immigrants to try to come to uh, better societies because it promises and it re gives them a better life. So this is not uniquely American endeavor. Maybe the, the way people pursue it and not how uniquely, much you emphasize. But more of an emphasis here? You're not even going to give me that. Eric, let me try no, that no. on you. Do you find that there is a, 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 a particular emphasis in North American culture on happiness that doesn't exist necessarily in other places in the world? Well, I can only speak as someone who's lived in America my whole life. And again, if you look at America and historically, America from the get-go defined itself as a sort of blessed special nation where utopias can be founded. And that idea still exists today. Um, I have talked to several journalists from other countries, though, since the publication of this book, and uh, many have said, journalists from England, journalists from uh, Spain, one from Italy, have said that indeed the, the American happiness industry is spreading through Europe like a plague. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm afraid that, that, that globalization may have its drawbacks if it spreads the smiley face um, throughout, throughout the globe. It is there, though, Jane, in your, con in your Declaration of Independence. You, know, you, don't, you don't see that up here in Canada. We don't have the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness happiness in our constitution. It's peace, order, and good government that's in our constitution, which is not quite... We're wild like that. Yeah, we're not quite so put I'm on a happy face. I'm Canada. <laughs> you like that better, do you? Well, wait a second. <laughs> Canadians are even a little bit happier than Americans, so you may not be very happy here. Then. Is that right? Now, how do you know that? Oh, there's uh, lots of uh, national surveys, and um, I'm maybe exaggerating the difference. Basically, we're pretty much uh, at par in happiness. Typically, Canada is a bit higher. Uh, and considering that we, in terms of wealth, are not as rich as the Americans, we're doing very well in terms of using our wealth to make people happy. Who are the happiest people in the world? Scandinavia does very well, so Scandinavian countries uh, 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 do very well. But one of the biggest predictors of that is uh, wealth. S uh, Switzerland is very happy. So uh, once you account for the wealth of a nation, there's very little else to predict on top of that, uh, what makes a country happy. In other words, places where they play hockey, they're the happiest. Mm -hmm. Think there's uh, a connection Yeah, there? yeah, north, very much in the Northern <laughs> Hemisphere, not what you might expect, uh, typically the warm climate and things like that. Hmm. So, uh, but, but that's what, also what, so social support networks, I it, think, as well, right? Taking care of your, your it, country. It, it is mm -hmm. just that if for whatever reason, other people know this better, the stable uh, uh, democracies, free, wealthy countries exist in the North.